Hello podcasters, welcome to another episode of Living History and thank you so much to everyone who's been sending in feedback about the podcast through Twitter, through Facebook, through all the channels that we've got. It's always really wonderful to hear from you and to hear that you're enjoying these chapters of history that we are bringing to you. I'm really enjoying bringing these chapters of history to you, so I'm glad you're enjoying hearing them as well. And there is a lot going on in the world of history. The centenaries continue. If you're listening to this podcast as soon as I've uploaded it, it will you will note that last week was the centenary of the Battle of Armion, the great Allied attack that took place on the 8th of August 1918. It's one of the most important battles of the First World War, and it gets fairly well overlooked uh, in the, the noise of everything else. The, the Battle of the Somme in 1916, the horrific fighting at Passchendaele in 1917. We tend to overlook these battles in 1918, and we shouldn't. They are so important. They were crucial in ending the war, and particularly this one, the big Battle of Armion. So it was great to see that it got a lot more publicity than I expected. A lot of people were very interested to learn that story. Today, we're not going to talk about the First World War on the podcast. We are going to fast forward to World War II, and I know everyone out there is a big fan of the Second World War. I know that you can't get enough of hearing stories about the Second World War, particularly Kokoda. Every time we do a podcast related to Kokoda, I see the stats and I see that the downloads just go through the roof. So obviously everyone out there has very good reasons to be very well connected to the story of Kokoda. So I'm going to look for more opportunities to tell these fascinating tales. And this week's story is one of those fascinating tales. It's a story you might not know. And it's being told by Peter Phelps, the great Australian actor who's been around for more than three decades. He's been on our screens. He's been involved in everything. He's done, he's done work on not only very popular shows on TV, but lots of our great history stories. He was in Dirtwater Dynasty. Famously, he was in The Light Horseman, that wonderful movie that was made back in the 80s. He's just been a, a pivotal character in the Australian documentary and television scene for a very long time. But interestingly, his grandfather had a very unusual experience during the Second World War. He was working as a miner in a little town in the highlands of New Guinea right at the time when the Japanese invaded. And even though he wasn't a soldier, he was just a civilian, he was forced to, at first it seemed like they were going to have to fight, but eventually they had to flee. And he fled across the Owen Stanley Ranges, not on the Kokoda track, but on another track called the Bulldog Track. And apparently this was much more treacherous than Kokoda itself. Apparently it was steeper, it was wetter, it was a lot more difficult. So Peter's grandfather and a group of other miners from this community spent months trekking through the Owen Stanleys in front of the Japanese who had, who had recently invaded. So it's a really wonderful story. It was a very personal story for Peter to tell because telling the story of his grandfather and his family at this terrible time was difficult and revealed a lot to him about his family. So I felt really honoured to sit down with Peter to hear about this personal family journey that he'd been on, but also just this wonderful story that I didn't know about in the, in, as part of the New Guinea campaign. So join me now and really enjoy this. It's a fascinating chat I had with Peter Phelps and his story of the Bulldog Track. A date which will live in infamy. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, may we say God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the governor again. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terrorist attack. This was their finest hour. Peter, thanks for joining us on Living History. Thanks, Matt. Good to be here. Now, you've been part of the Australian film and TV industry for probably 30, 35 years 38, now. 38, 38 years. 38 this year. How have yeah. you seen the industry evolve and change in that, that very long career? Yeah, there's been a lot of changes. Um, we are sitting in a studio at the moment with a portable recording setup that's uh, something that never happened when I started out uh, and doing a podcast in digital format. I was uh, very much grew up with the analog world. Um, so... The speed of filmmaking is a little bit different because everything's digitised. Everything was shot on film stock or very old videotape in the TV studio. Um, but the one thing that didn't change is storytelling, acting another writer's words, writing uh, screenplays and books. That hasn't changed. Um, the way it's delivered is different. But if, if you're an actor or a writer... It's, it hasn't really changed at all. Uh, just the technology that delivers what you've written or acted. Uh, so it really doesn't affect you uh, because we're, we're, we're doing something that's very ancient as storytellers and uh, actors and writers. 
we're uh, doing something that the ancients did. The, the Aborigines, the indigenous people of every country were telling stories of their forefathers and of their dream time uh, in a way that's not very different to what we're doing. So there's a lot of differences, but there's a hell of a lot of similarities in what we do. This new era we're in with, as you say, digital technology and, and everyone can distribute a, a film on YouTube or on the internet, how do you feel the state of the industry is now? Is it, is it better than it used to be because of this technology? Is it worse? Have we lost any of the magic? Uh, yeah, I think um, a lot of the artistry has gone because we're not telling stories in a dramatic sense like we, we did pretty much exclusively with, um, you know, I'm not going to go on to bag reality shows as such, but um, that sto- sort of storytelling is really unappealing for someone with any artistic kind of bent they have. Uh, that's that's a big difference, the, the, the stories that people want to see, but I think it's more that networks uh, want to have people watch more than what people want. People love a good story, you know, whether it be a drama or a, a book or any other theatre plays. They want, they want a good story. And most of the stuff that's mass-produced is just not, not a good story, you know. Um, cooks competing against each other to make a dish in a certain amount of time. That's not a story to me. That's just not uh, appealing at all. Um, you know, it's, it has its place. People sort of like that sort of thing. and having uh, people watch TV and you watch TV to watch people watch TV, uh, it, it's sort of a perverse art, artistic form. And, uh, you know, it, it is what it is, but uh, it's not storytelling as I'd like to see. You mentioned storytelling and Australia has a, a wonderful... Uh, history of making really great history dramas and and you've been a part of of, of of a lot of them and going back to I remember you back in the Light Horseman watching you yeah. back in those days and I remember the 80s with all the Kennedy Miller the, the great miniseries it seems to have died yeah. off now in, yeah. in Australia we don't we don't seem to do it as well but how important do you think that the these historic dramas how important has that been in telling the Australian story well this is why um, there's a lot of you know sort of protest now about uh, getting Australian stories on screen because uh, we have to keep those sort of things to document our history, to tell our own stories. And um, the arts funding has been cut with a lot of... Uh, so we can't tell these stories anymore because the money's not there simply to make these um, these stories. Uh, it was there in the 80s. There were um, government uh, funding bodies that are actually still there but they have less and less to to give to filmmakers um, so uh, I think it's really important to keep those stories alive do even remakes of what we've uh, what we've done because there's new generations coming in that they don't, they would know about the last charge of B Sheba which was the last horse charge in in, in war I gave a talk to my local school and uh, they loved it because it, it, they saw the film before. I came and gave a talk, and I even had the wardrobe that I wore in, the, in that film, and they just loved it because it was their great grandfathers, uh, and the, the story was uh, a real tangible tale. And uh, even the fact that they, my, my daughters were in the audience, and they, they saw, they they knew that that, just, that was real. That film actually, that they really, these guys really did that. Our our forefathers. So it's that, that that's important. It's it's our storylines. It's our um, song lines, as it were. The white fella song lines uh, are portrayed in our film and TV. Um, I think you remember you remember our historical pieces much more than you remember a cooking show. I can guarantee that. <laughs> I think you're right. It does feel to me that. The young generation, and I mean, I don't want to sound like an old fart here. It's easy to say, yeah. oh, the young generation. Yeah, we, we, we certainly are these days. But younger people don't connect with history. And, and I'm, I'm leading this into talking about your your book, which is a you know, which which certainly blows the lid off everything I'm saying because it's a great piece of history. Mm. Younger people don't seem to engage as strongly with this history um, as previous generations did. And I understand why. I understand that. I mean, in some ways, it's a good thing because it means that. 
they haven't had to live through this experience. They haven't had to live through a war or depression or see their father come home a broken man. Is that, my, is gen- that- my generation too. I, I, I grew up with this story that we'll talk about uh, soon about the book. I grew up not really, you know, we were a teenager and the, the most important thing is that, that you're surfing good on a, on a, on a wave or well, you, you, you're going to win that Saturday football match, you know. That, and you just, oh, yeah, I've heard about the depression, you know. It's something that happened with Pop and Nan and Pop and my mum and dad when they were kids and, you know, oh, that was really unfortunate. So you've got to eat all your dinner and you've got to save your money and, uh, you know, but... You're a rebellious kid, so those stories weren't important. It's only later in life that you realise, wow, that was that was their life. They they had men fighting in Europe to, uh, you know, save our democracy, to save our our country. Um, Those things don't come till later in life. You know, when you realise, wow, they did a lot. They sacrificed for their families, and I I wonder how I would go in in such adverse conditions. And um, it. I think that's why you got to keep these stories alive. Well, let's talk about this, the story that uh, that you've told so uh, so eloquently, the the bulldog track, which is a very a very intense personal story for mm-hmm. you. It's about your family. It's I really enjoyed it because it's an interesting chapter of history that I didn't know very much about at all, which relates very closely to the New Guinea campaign. Um, but it's also an intensely personal story for you and your family. Well, before we delve into the the story in the book, just tell us about. What led you? What was your journey that went from I've heard these old family stories to actually sitting down, researching it and writing this book? It came as a simple request, I suppose, from my mother and my auntie Joy, who's 91 years of age. She's the only one of the immediate family of the Phelpses that was involved, that's in the book. Um, it, it, it happened fairly organically. I, um, I got hold of... Uh, uh, the pith helmet that my grandfather uh, had in the highlands of New Guinea as a, he was a gold miner and a carpenter. And uh, in the trek that we'll talk about later, he kept a diary on his pith helmet written in his carpenter's pencil. And I only discovered this uh, when, about 10 years ago that my auntie had it hidden away with all these photos of this trip. And uh, uh, some memorabilia, a mud map that he wrote in indelible ink on baking paper uh, along the way. And this was intriguing. This was tangible evidence of what my grandpa did in the war. Um, <clears throat> so I delved into the research and made my uh, dad a promise who passed away halfway through writing this book. I promised him and I'd get this story out there. And... Um, I dived into the research and realised that, you know, I've got so much of the military background of the Kokoda campaign leading up to the Kokoda campaign and Buna, Gona, the Battle of Wau, the taking of Ley and Salamawa, all the, the New Guinea campaigns, but it was all military. There was nothing about civilian miners and carpenters having to evade the Japanese and go over this amazing epic journey. Um, <clears throat> so... From there, I just dived into more and more. But there was always there was a scant documentation of these fellas on this trip because uh, they were civilians mostly. Um, everything that was documented was military based. Uh, so I had lots and lots of research on the gold dredging activities and the military uh, battles and uh, anything that was military based, but nothing on uh, the civilians. Uh, well, so, tell us the story. I mean, it's well, it's it's well, a remarkable. Fam- tale. It was there was bits of an- there was bits of anecdotes that pop just dolloped along the years, you know. And uh, my uh, my auntie Joy was kind of the family historian, so she came out with a few. My mother had some stories about when she went black fishing with with my pop, and he'd just come out one day and say, "Oh yeah, we we ran into the cannibal tribes at one point." And uh, <laughs> what what <laughs> yeah so no they didn't eat us obviously but because uh, they had their women and children with them so uh, we weren't our heads were kept on our shoulders so that's all right so yeah they kept on fishing you know uh, so I pieced these all together like a magpie and uh, and um, came up with scenarios where, where he had written inscriptions on his helmet and on the map and from there I 
used my writer and actor's imagination to see, okay, what what were you actually doing, Pop? You say that there were, you hunted tree kangaroo with spears and, and from that point, you know, how did you do that? And I make a chapter out of, uh, you know, they're, they're being rescued by missionaries, which was like in, in six words on the helmet. So you, you say, okay, I know you were there at that certain point and this happened. You have to expand on that and, um, you know, uh, Make it a make make the narrative through these little scant pieces of evidence. So we're in 1942. We're in New Guinea, uh, right at the start of the the, the Japanese incursions into yeah. New Guinea. Tell us a story. What was yeah, your pop doing a, there, and 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 what happened on the bulldog yeah, track? I'll try to keep it in a chronological order. Uh, <laughs> uh, my pop uh, had tried to enlist with this, the outbreak of the war, but he uh, he was 43 at the time of the outbreak of the war. He was a an out of work carpenter. And uh, he couldn't enlist because he had a gammy leg and probably deemed a bit too old. Because he tried to enlist during the First World he War, did. didn't he? Yeah, but he was too young then. He's uh, He tried to enlist when he was uh, 16. And uh, his mother, Margaret, my great-grandmother, pulled him out of the enlistment office by his ear, much to the chagrin of his, much to the laughter of his mates and the chagrin of my grandfather. But he, uh, he didn't make it then. He was a cadet, and that's as close as he got at St Joseph's College. Uh, so he missed on both times. Um, he was offered at work. Um, f- before that, he came across an eccentric of punch bowl in Sydney at the time uh, who was known as the witch, and she used to give random fortune tellings to people in the street just uh, in the, along the boulevard, which is still the main strip of punch bowl. And uh, she'd said that you're going to go far, far away, and you're going you're gonna to be in danger, but you're going to make it through. Thanks, which, you know, he pop just got on with it. And uh, anyway, a few weeks later, he got offered work and said, because uh, he, he was driving a truck with timber, uh, timber deliveries. And um, <coughs> there was one day, one, one side of thing, he had an accident and a girl was killed. And not long after that, uh, he was offered work by one of his workmates who said that there's good work going in the highlands of New Guinea. Uh, it was such a random situation that he, he said, look, you're going to get three times the wage as a carpenter and gold miner, and uh, they, it's tax-free work, it's accommodation-free, and it's very attractive. And he said they also um, have families up there, they have family accommodation. So he went to my nana. My nana said that uh, there's no way they're going up to a jungle where kids pull the kids out of school, so Pop decided to uh, go there solo, and he was very quickly trained up in gold dredging and uh, took on work as a carpenter, which is, you know, maintaining the dwellings there that were all modern cottages. Um, and the labourers, had the native labourers had a, their own compound along the ridges of the town. Uh, he'd look after the bridges and the, uh, the sluices in the gold mining areas as well as being a gold miner on eight-hour eight shifts, 24 hours a day. And... Um, he uh, was near, near the end of his three-year tenure when um, 42 days previous to the, the start of this journey, the Japanese had de- decimated Pearl Harbor. Uh, they'd taken Singapore along with um, you know the, the, the blokes they put into Changi. Uh, they took Rabaul, they took the northern cities of S- um, PNG of uh, Salamoa and, and Leh. And the gold miners kept mining uh, until January 21st. They uh, bombed and strafed his gold mining town of Bololo, including uh, the decimation of three of their planes uh, called Pat, Paul and Peter. <laughs> uh, so that was, that was it. There was no transport out of there. The, the Japanese took out the radio communications towers, the uh, hydroelectric plant, so the town was completely shut off and there was no way out of there. The men who were the miners then became soldiers. They were enlisted. But my pop was one of 200 men who were deemed too old or unfit. So they had to get out of there because uh, there's no mining left from that moment on in history. They decided to hike to Wow, which is 20 miles up into the highlands, uh, to fly out there. But the very next day they hiked in. The same Japanese flotilla bombed Wow, took out those planes. They were stuck. Uh, the military from then, which was a scant military force called the New Guinea Volunteer Rifles, they became the Kanga Force, and uh, they were without the, the military from this point on. They uh, went up to an abandoned uh, mining camp called Edie Creek, 
and from there with the natives' advice and uh, no supplies at all, they set out on uh, the bulldog track, it became known as, and they were the first white fellas on there. A group of 200 miners became groups of 15 to 20. My pop was the first ones out. Uh, so they were treading into foreign territory. And even after you know a couple of uh, valleys and ridges over the Owen Stanley Ranges, the native boys were fo- in foreign land as well because they were from the highlands and they never shifted out of the highlands. They didn't trade with the people of the coast or the floodplains. Uh, so they were coming into foreign territory too. My pop tells me of, uh, I remember the few, the few anecdotes I did get was that they would enter villages with uh, like 15 native boys and 17 miners. Uh, the, miners were armed, the, the miners weren't armed. One guy had a rifle, that's all. Um, the, the, the native guys had bows and arrows and spears and then the, the white fellas had hunting knives. Uh, and they'd be entering villages where they hadn't seen white men before. And he said that they, some of them thought that they were the ghosts of the ancestors, you know, like the, a lot of the, our own indigenous people used to think uh, at t- certain times. So they were, were in a foreign land because to this day there was 800 different languages spoken in, in New Guinea. And uh, they... Um, they would come into places where they didn't know the other villagers' tongue. But they were mostly friendly uh, because they knew who the enemy was. They're the ones that were bombing their villages. And these, these white fellows were Aussies, and uh, Aussies, Aussies were known to be the, uh, friend, not foe. And they made it over the Owen Stanley Ranges and uh, got there by all sorts of uh, cunning and, and, and skill, native bush skill and the men's white fella skills like building rafts made from fallen trees and tying it with the local vine um, they were rescued at certain points by missionaries uh, and um, put up in the missionary not, not my first the first mission my grandfather wasn't because he had written, renounced his faith after his uh, sisters had desecrated the graves of his um, uh, three day born and died son and 16 month old daughter who died when they found out that the, my grandmother was a Protestant. So he'd re- he had previously renounced his faith. So being saved by Catholic missionaries wasn't really a, a, a going thing for him until they got near the end of their trek where they were saved by, uh, well, pretty much um, recuperated by um, the French Catholic mission in uh, Yule Island where the nuns and priests uh, really got them back on their feet before they went uh, by mission launch to Port Moresby, which was at the end of their trek, of course. And uh, as they were going into port, through Port Moresby Harbour, they were once again bombed by the Japanese and uh, they would managed to dodge that bullet before getting to Port Moresby and getting a, a schooner to uh, Cairns. And it was from there, and at all this time, my family in Punch Bowl in Sydney thought um, he was dead. How long did it take them to, to, to walk the That's track? About three months. If you did it now, it would be like, you know, 10 days to two weeks or even less. Uh, but they stopped a lot of times to, for fellas to catch up with their health uh, in villages for days and weeks sometimes. Um, so it was a, a slow trek. They weren't in any, any hurry. Um, it was also they were getting further and further away from the Japanese, even though during the walk Darwin was bombed. So... Um, they didn't know that. They um, they just trekked on as they were. But the Japanese were very active all all around the country with their you know with their activities. I think they were the furthest away from it. But this tr- this this track trek that he did was about six months before the Kokoda campaign started, uh, and it was considered a tougher slog, wetter and muddier and steeper and, than the Kokoda Trail. That's, uh, that's from Osmar White, who was a journalist at the time who did the track, not, not, not long after my grandfather. Um, and the Kokoda track is from Kokoda, the village of Kokoda to Port Moresby and it's land to land. Their trek on the bulldog track was, you know, over mountains, uh, a lot more mountains than Kokoda. Uh, they hit the floodplains and then there was rivers and rapids and, you know, it was a lot more adverse factors came into it. Uh, but they did make it out. Um, and the reason that the, when they found out um, that my grandfather was alive, it was only through a telegram that he'd sent from Cairns, and this is you know, six months they thought he was dead. Uh, 
there was a telegram that said, uh, arrive central 9pm, love dad. <laughs> No. It's such. It's just such a remarkable story. I'm just amazed that your grandfather didn't talk about it more. I mean, if, I think if this happened to any of us today, this would be the uh, the thing that defined yeah, no. us for the rest of our lives. And we tell everyone at every opportunity, yeah. we tell them. But this was that that generation, wasn't it? They didn't mm. speak about these things. Everyone had a story about some hardship during the war or the depression, and they yeah. just didn't talk about it. And the talks I've been giving around uh, the the country in the middle of this tour I'm doing. Uh, there's a, there's always someone that comes up and says, you know, I have the same sort of story. My, my, he didn't talk about it. He didn't say anything about it. Um, I, and I think, I don't know, in my grandfather's instance, you know, I, I've only put in the book uh, small suggestions of why this is. Is it because there was a girl killed in an accident and not long after he went to New Guinea, um, it wasn't because... Uh, they really did need the money and he was getting genuine money sent back every month. Um, uh, they didn't want to grandstand. They, they didn't want to blow their trumpet, you know, and they weren't in uniform so, and they wanted to be. Uh, they weren't fighting. So why, why shout out about this adventure they're on because they've got men fighting and saving the country. So they might have been a bit quiet because of that. You mentioned that... Uh that you had a, a, a patchwork of information about what your grandfather had been through and you had to fill in the blanks. How did you go about that process of trying to, you know, with your grandfather long gone, with, with mm. no one around who had been there to tell the story, how did you go putting the jigsaw pieces together to, to tell this fascinating tale? Well, well, to tie it up, thankfully my my um, 91-year-old auntie had read it and said, yep, that's, that's how I remember it. Uh from what he said, I pieced it together by uh, just, I think it's the actor's imagination and the writer's uh, licence to say, well, you know, this dialogue was probably not quite what they said, but, you know, you, I know what the situation was. I know, and I created the scenario of the tiny little fragments of information that I did have. Um, so there is a bit of dramatic licence there, but... Um, I do know that the facts are are there because he did write those th- things down. So, you know, I pieced together and um, I had the plot in place because he lived it. So that that wasn't hard. The structure was something that just just flowed out of me. Uh, the way I, I write, the voice just comes, and it's one of those things. You're you're a writer yourself, you know. So where did that come from? There's there's, there's a little eureka moment. It's those wonderful moments, yeah, isn't it? Like, where, where it's like you're well, just you know you're just the the channel for this yeah, this, this information yeah, to come. Exactly. On the page. It kind of, as Stephen King says, some the, the story writes itself. You know, it's uh, but the story was already in place, and I just had to f- fill in the blanks, and I did that with. Um, with the muse, I suppose, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> well, you mentioned the voice that comes out through the book, and I think that's the thing that for me really stood out. And I, I love this way of telling history. It's 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 a really it's a it's a fantastic way to tell a story when you know you've got the basis of a story, but then you have to to fill in the blanks, as you yeah. said. And I love the result because you, as you say, the voice of the story, the colloquialisms, the language of the day. It really is a window into uh, into into that period of time, and we've lost it a little bit, haven't we? The, the, this sort of the, the that that generation and the way they spoke and the way they thought about things, we, we we've really lost that a little bit, haven't we? Yeah, I think so. Um, everything's so immediate. Um, you know, the stories we t- tell now are like uh, you know one one minute tweets. Uh, so the long form is, but I I as I go around. Look, we get to libraries and to bookshops and, uh, on this promo thing I'm doing. Um, I see that it's not lost. It's it's a, it's alive as, as as anything. You know, there's still people that don't don't feel the need to, you know, look at someone's breakfast that they had on on a <laughs> on a Instagram or whatever. You know, so I think the long form will always survive. It's like um, TV. Took over radio, and it didn't. But radio is more alive than, than anything, and it's now um, podcasts are increasing, like this one, and uh, that's that's another way of storytelling. So, I think the book will always be. This must have been a really emotional journey for you to to delve back into the family history. And you mentioned your own father passed away mm. during the during the writing of the book, and and obviously. Um, you must have felt a very strong connection to your grandfather in the, in the construction of this. How how was that journey? Was this a, was this an, a, an emotional experience for you? 
Uh, yeah, of course it was. But I, you know, I was in a, on a bit of a promise with Dad. Uh, so he was always there looking over my shoulder and uh, he saw near the end I was reading passages to him and I'd get the squeeze of the hand and some thumbs up and when he when he was the last time he could speak he was he said he was proud and so he was always there and in, in and still there in spirit when I read back passages of it I I um sort of get a lump in your throat you know it's it was something that was very very close to me and um I know he'd be happy what do you want readers to take away from this what's the what's the lesson of this story what uh you know what what can a reader learn from this about that generation and about this period of time uh the uh the closeness of family the wanting to get back to that family uh is the sole kind of motivator to do the thing the resilience of of men and women the um <clears throat> the strength of family ties um mateship uh, just uh that great aussie practicality of well we're going to we haven't got a town anymore we've got to get out of here and get back home so they just got to went about it like uh, the, the Aussie, that great cliched Aussie spirit, but it is it, it was true. And, you know, that, I think that that kind of shines through in my pop's uh, story. What's uh, what's next on the radar for Peter Phelps? What, <laughs> what's, the, what's the next book or the TV show we're going to see down the road? Oh, there's, uh, there's a couple of things that are coming out. There's a, f- a film that's being released next week. Uh, I've got a little bit in. It's uh, called Chasing Comets. It's a rugby league story, so it's a it's a bit of a light light fair, but apparently it's really funny. Uh, and there's a US, uh, sorry, UK Australian based uh, TV series that we're shooting up in Queensland. Uh, I'm making initial steps into uh, turning this book into a three part mini series, and uh, I would like to direct the Sydney side of things that I might be acting in because I want to be playing my grandfather, which is a bit of a unique position of writing the book and then writing the screenplay and then going off and playing your grandfather. The only thing is I'm going to have to cast the other actors all shorter because my pot was six foot and I'm five foot nine. So <laughs> I have to do a Tom Cruise and cast them all shorter. Well, I, I certainly wish you all the luck with that because it's a it's a wonderful story, and I'm you know I know that your reasons for writing it were very personal, but but I and I think I speak for lots of people will be very glad that you did this because it's just such a it's an extraordinary story and one that most people wouldn't know. So uh, the book is called The Bulldog Track. It's available now Australia wide. Uh, and Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. 